Sipapu, a Hopi word, is a small round hole in the floor of underground kivas and pit houses used by ancient people. It symbolizes the portal through which their ancient ancestors first entered today's world. The Sipapu Hole is a place of connection with the earth and the past. In today's modern society, there are those who carry Sipapu in their hearts, a connection to their earthly roots, to all human roots. These people are found all over the world and work and live around us. These primitives are among us. Those interested in primitive skills come from many different backgrounds. Okay. I actually used to teach school. I actually taught community college for a few years and got into this and just got addicted to it. In real life, um, I do electronics more specifically. I'm a microwave integrated circuit designer. So um, I guess a, a simplification is, is I design, work on the design of the radio part of cell phones. Okay, so I mean, I used to do GPS receiver development and lots of other, uh, um, you know, rather uh, microwave integrated kinds of things. The level of intelligence and creativity in this crowd is astounding. Most of them are so multi-talented on so many levels of art, culture, they're generous, it's fun to be with them, and I learn a lot from them. And I learn skills, but mostly I learn about community. I want to choose to live off the grid, and I am learning how to grow my own food and learning how to do um, survival skills. I believe that the primitive skills movement is a, going to be a, a movement that's going to change and shape the society as it changes. I feel like I have a foot in two worlds, essentially, because I'm not living 100% traditional. It's more or less impossible. For one thing, is you know, it's illegal to be a hunter-gatherer. You have to have a permit. You can't gather whatever you want, wherever you want. I was selling high-end designer women's clothing like Chanel and Armani. I went to a premiere, a movie premiere, outside of Zion National Park, and in the gift store, I happened to come across the strangest thing, and it was a little piece of brain tan buckskin, the smokiness, somehow, it sounds very woo-woo to me, it just resonated or some remembrance of past lives, I don't know, but it was so motivating, I had to know more about the people who did it. I'm making a basket bottom. New people have this, this uh, view that we're practicing Native American skills. These are human skills, and Native Europeans practice them. In some cases, they practice them centuries or thousands of years before Native Americans. I think it's important that just in the last century or two, we've really lost most of these technological skills that people had worldwide, and, and we're trying to either rediscover them or regain them before they're lost entirely. Working on a gourd bowl. Most of us have forgotten how to use our hands and uh, we've forgotten the satisfaction of working directly with resources and materials. Uh, so from a, a wellness standpoint, I think it's important for us to learn how to use our hands again. I'm making a loom weaving. Being able to go out in the wilderness and belong to it, to be able to use all these skills and create not just a survival situation, but a thrival. You know, being able to thrive in the situation and to uh, really live with the land. I got started in these skills largely through my grandmother uh, when I was a kid. I liked to hang out at uh, her place and we would go on walks and collect herbs for tea, things like uh, blue violets and yarrow and come back and make tea. And um, she had the interest in the survival skills and I picked that up from her. I'm crushing the crucifixion thorn herb. When we start to look back at ancient or traditional skills, 
and look at the way our ancestors lived on the planet in balance, there's a, a lot of valuable learning there. How did they do that? They're looking for, for things that connect them to the land in which they live. And, and so the, the skills are much more deliberate. And when you participate in the skills, they not only teach you about the place, but they teach you about yourself. It's this ancient question, who we are, where do we come from? What, what does it mean? Um, are we connected? Is it, or are we just here? And newcomers have different reasons for wanting to learn. We're a pretty soft society. <laughs> so I thought maybe, hey, it might be wise to know something. Besides that, I like learning. So this, the instructors here uh, are full of uh, knowledge. I want to learn all the different skills that it'll take in order to live out in the woods without any modern stuff, without Gore-Tex or plastic. If, if uh, your food doesn't get delivered to the grocery store, because we run out of petroleum, for example, <laughs> you know, it starts to become more evident that skills like this really need to be not only preserved but practiced. This is my first year at Rabbit Stick and um, my whole life I wanted to work in a living history museum <laughs> or a living history exhibit and then I found out about this and it's like I mean, this is this is history all around us. Oh, I'm making a, a needle out of a turkey bone. I put the hole in it and now I'm just kind of sharpening it to a nice little point. One of the first skills taught is making cordage or string from hand-picked natural materials. And you take the fiber and uh, twist it into cordage. Nothing is wasted with this group. It's maybe a couple of days worth of, of brushings. Get hair out of my brush. Many of these skills have been lost or were on the brink. Much of the modern primitive skills movement started with a very unassuming man. I'll plant this to garlic a little later on today. In rural Idaho, a man tends his garden after a lifetime of helping people learn about outdoor survival skills. He's Larry Dean Olson. Not a well-known name in general, but among survival experts, he's a pioneer. Very often I would just say, what have I done? He's considered the father of what is known as the modern primitive skills movement. The word got around that I knew how to live off the land. And uh, people started asking me, you know, take me out, take me out. In the 1960s, while a young self-taught survival instructor at Brigham Young University in Utah, Larry D. Nolson developed a unique outdoor survival course. Courses like this didn't exist. Students headed into the wilderness for long periods with little or no food or equipment. A lot of people took the class, hundreds and hundreds. Very little primitive skills information was available, so Olson wrote a textbook. In 1967, Larry Dean Olson published Outdoor Survival Skills. So Larry's book was kind of the impetus to, to show people that the skills were still there. They had application in the outdoors. They were actually tangible skills you could work on and master in order to be a person who could live in the outdoors on its terms and learn from the outdoors. So Larry's book, Across the Board, I think has been an influence on just about everybody. I have a very great debt of gratitude to Larry for the inspiration that he provided for me of showing that all of these things were possible. I got my biggest boost in life probably from Larry's book in terms of learning how to do something. Larry Dean Olson's book did it for me. My grandmother had Larry Dean Olson's book, Outdoor Survival Skills, and that was instrumental for me for firing the imagination and getting things, uh, getting me started uh, trying some things. And also the, uh, the Tom Brown books were highly inspirational that I was, uh, uh, got me excited about the possibilities. In the 1970s and 80s, interest began to grow across the country. Tom Brown helped train many people in the skills. What got, originally got me interested is Tom Brown. Uh, his classes were large, but it, it spurred my interest. I got a phone call one day at my office at BYU, and it was Robert Redford. And he said, that we're doing this movie, Jeremiah Johnson, I want you to come and teach us how to do some of these things. Some primitives were asked to spend a week on an island with a screenwriter to give him ideas for a movie. I'll just take him out and we'll live off the land for seven days. When he's done, he'll know how hard it is, how unromantic it can often be, and maybe make a more realistic film. 
days. And during that time, we joked all the time and played all the time. We found a popped volleyball on the beach and started kicking it around and calling him Wilson because that was what was written on his side of his head. And we were very, very mean to this popped volleyball. We had no idea he was going to become a great movie star. Olson went on to develop the format that hundreds of wilderness survival schools now use. And with Ezekiel Sanchez, Olson created some of the earliest youth and adult wilderness therapy programs now modeled throughout the world. Uh, the Western model of, of wilderness therapy is clearly Larry Olson's the source. There were people from other colleges and other places who wanted to get involved. And so I started the rabbit stake. So Dick Jamison carried it on for several years after that. Then Dave Westcott came along and said, Larry, let's get Rabbit Stick going again. And he's, he's the guy that made it what it is today. It's internationally known. The original interest came from, from the skills. The level of competence in primitive skills has shot up so fast, so far so fast, because people have really dedicated themselves to it. We have so many things in common, interest-wise and belief-wise and value-wise, uh, that um, that's what brings us together. In the shadows of the Grand Teton on the banks of the Snake River near Rexburg, Idaho, people gather at Rabbit Stick. Even though this is mountain man territory, this is not a mountain man rendezvous, nor is it a dress up and pretend event. These primitives teach and practice very ancient skills. Rabbit Stick is the oldest, largest primitive skills gathering in the world. So it's a place where a lot of people come and we share ideas. We share them with students, old students, new students, and we share them with each other. So it's kind of a consortium of information to prevent it from being lost, to spread that information throughout wherever it needs to be spread. It's an amazing place to come and learn for instructor and student alike. In a lot of ways, um, you could say that the folks who are here are really the keepers of the, this, a lot of the ancient technologies, the holders. In casual conversation with many of these people, you'll hear astounding real-life stories, such as boats sinking in the Amazon River, dog mushing in the Arctic, or living for extended periods among indigenous people. I live part of the year in the Yukon Territory, and I travel quite a bit. I'm writing a book on primitive technology, so I visit different, different instructors, and I also spend quite a bit of time in Indian reservations. We're breaking this antler in half the old-fashioned way, so without a saw. <laughs> some of the skills in technology involve simple, what some would call caveman technology. Other primitive skills are very complex. This is a Stone Age use of the Bernoulli effect, which was uh, discovered by an Italian, but invented by nature. You, you, a lot of air blows over a surface and creates a, a vacuum and lifts the, the paint out of this, this little short straw by lots of air volume blowing over with this straw. We cover pretty much the entirety of human history as, as Homo sapiens, but we also cover things that go much further back. Uh, you know, the cobble tool class, uh, you know, we try to replicate tools that were used upwards of two, two and a half million years ago. The cognitive skills involved with producing stone tools are still very much part of who we are. When it comes down to everything that we have in life, it's basically rocks and sticks put together in complex forms that create what we have in society. So if you have a fire, and you have a rock, and you have a stick, you can live. I enjoy, I enjoy making pots, and I love turning people on to making pots. Students tend to really enjoy the fact that they can make a pot out of mud, basically, and fire it, turn it to ceramic, and then cook out of it. So it represents a very important involvement uh, into, uh, in the cooking area of primitive cultures. I think my skill, especially, is, uh, you know, doing tracking. Like this footprint here today, you know, he went by here, you know, and we're looking at this, uh, the edges here, you know, if this thing was probably maybe 12 hours, and the edges here will start breaking in. Then along here, you know, you'll see little insects. 
You test and try everything to find out what's, what's in it. And they found that certain ores produced, you know, certain types of rock would produce a metal if you heated it high enough. And what we're teaching is low temperature metal casting, uh, an alloy of zinc and tin called pewter. Uh, modern humans started casting metal about 6,000 years ago, uh, between five and 6,000 years ago. You carve a mold in soapstone and warm it up and you melt the metal and you take a ladle and you, you of, of hot molten metal and pour it into that soapstone mold and you gotta wait for a little while until you crack that thing open and it may have taken you a couple days to carve the mold but boy when you crack that mold open it's, it's just like Christmas. It's your birthday all over again. There is a symbolism be behind all these technologies and investigating that symbolism, the deeper meaning behind it can be quite fascinating. From a symbolic point of view Bows are feminine and arrows are masculine, and yet the arrow doesn't go anywhere unless the bow sends it. My major at, in college was biology, botany. And so from learning the plants to learning their uses and how humans relate to them was the next step. Not just learning the plants and naming them and knowing about them, but knowing how they relate to human beings. And a lot of the teachers were dying off and they were not continuing. The young people were getting caught up, sucked up in the modern world and computer technology and they didn't have time or desire to learn the ancestral basketry. So that was my focus in grad school is to seek out and preserve some of those traditions. At that point the baskets in the museums become the teachers themselves. They are the elders, they are the teachers and all you got to do is talk to them. Some believed that everything that you think or feel or do gets woven into that basket um, as you're weaving it. And they don't want any negative thoughts, feelings, memories, illnesses, anything woven into that basket because then it's set, fixed for all time. The basket is not a product. What you make has no bearing on anything. It doesn't matter what you make as long as you make it well and with a good heart or a good mind or good thoughts. Nowadays, people think of them in terms of objects, a thing, a product. And some of those older elders that are gone now thought of them in terms of a process. And you weave on it until it's done. The most commonly asked question is, how long does it take? Totally irrelevant question to ancestral skills. It takes as long as it takes to make it, and no longer. I'm not in any hurry to finish a basket. I want it to last as long as I possibly can, because it's, it's a journey, it's a path. Skin on frame kayaks are definitely a primitive skill. Um, they have originally built Stone Age tools and they've been used um, around the Pacific Rim for at the very least 2,000 years, more likely uh, spanning back some 4,000 years. Water polo is a really sneaky little way <laughs> to get people really um, excited about kayaking and, and to get people into the boats and to get them to try a lot of the advanced kayaking skills that are out there. Personally, I think kayaking itself and uh, skin on frame in particular um, is a really fantastic way for modern people, especially to connect with uh, primitive technology or even just connecting with uh, living close to the land and connecting to themselves. Because um, kayaking is a <clears throat> one of those ways that brings you out truly into the wilderness. When you get onto the water, everything else disappears. You know, all the things that you took with you, uh, that you were going to take with you when you went on your uh, backpacking trip, those things are all gone. Group members debate on what to call themselves. Primitive. In the modern world, it tends to mean crude. So I don't like that word at all. I use the word ancestral for everybody's older life skills. There are also people around here who use the word abo skills. Uh, referring to Australian Aborigines. Well, in Australia, abo is a pejorative, so I try not to use that word. When not at these gatherings, these primitives offer a wide variety of instruction all around the world. One of the earliest programs is the Boulder Outdoor Survival School, or BOSS, located in Utah's high desert. Coming off a week living with and learning from the land, participants prepare the hot rocks and enter a sweat lodge to cleanse and heal their bodies and spirits.
we're sort of advertised as a survival school and so some people come because they want to learn uh, specific survival skills but I think that most people when they leave BOSS they leave with something a lot a lot deeper and a lot greater and I think that what BOSS is really about is about personal growth uh, and about learning something about yourself without the distractions of modern society. Uh, it gives people a lot more time to think about what's important in their lives. It's an amazing thing the first time you see fire come out of your hands from something that you did, um, something that you've made. I let out a scream and a, and a hoot, so it was very gratifying. I don't think I'm going to go home and uh, make a boat drill fire, uh, but I do know that I was able to do it. Um, and it gives me a good feeling of appreciating what I have. A lot of what this course has done for me is sort of an empowerment thing because all of these things that I was really apprehensive about turned out to be really straightforward yeah. for me. The primitive skills movement is seen in many places. Schools are found across the country. Flint napping gatherings or nap-ins are common as well. Wilderness therapy is used around the world and classroom programs introduce many kids to wilderness experiences. It's been amazing for me to watch, uh, having uh, been here at the first rabbit stick and then to see this exploding across the country with um, uh, more gatherings and schools popping up all the time. We do um, primitive technology, we do corporate team building using primitive technology, so uh, team building with fire making or team building with uh, survival techniques. As we take people out and with natural history, with stone age skills, survival skills, and also ecological restoration of the land, we teach them to interact with nature in an intimate way so that they get to know it themselves and form personal relationships with different natural entities. And with the stone age skills especially, when you start to make something uh, from a bush, from a rock, you form a relationship that no one else has formed before. Okay, It's your own unique relationship with that. We provide classes uh, for, the, uh, for adults on outdoor wilderness survival skills, including fire making, shelter, awareness, uh, procuring food. One of our main focuses in the 20 years of our business is how do we take those traditional skills, learn from the past, understand the, the balance, the sustainability of them, and combine it with appropriate modern technologies. I take people into the wilderness and teach them how to live there on the wilderness's terms as opposed to bringing all of their, their stuff with them. I get them to leave their stuff behind internally and externally and, and reconnect with the earth and themselves. I'm making sandals like this that are right here. I'm not looking for weekend warriors, people who want to just kind of come learn a fun skill, you know, and then put it on the mantelpiece, you know. What I'm looking for are people who want an immersion experience into wilderness living. Stone Age, I like Stone Age because you can look around and uh, you know, if you need a cutting blade, well, you just need to find some rock. I teach bushcraft skills at home in England and have done for the past two years. And um, I really wanted to expand my skills in that area, look at more ways that I could use the natural environment. We've been doing this for eight years now, uh, taking kids out for three days and two nights. And we do this with the public schools, so we don't miss any of the kids. My interest in this is a little bit different than a lot of people's. I like to learn what I can here and then take it home and then kind of twist it and make it modern for my own uses, like making boots or bags. The flute of Coyote Smith wakes the camp each morning at Winter Count in the desert outside of Phoenix. Winter Count is the southwestern equivalent to Rabbit Stick, where hundreds gather to share and learn. There aren't many places where you can build a kayak, hollow out a blow dart gun, and roast a wild duck within a few feet. Oh, 
The atlatl is a weapon system that was used all over the world that predated the bow and arrow. And basically what it is, it's a stick with a hook on it. And what the stick does is it allows you to have a longer arm, so you have a lot more speed at the end of the atlatl uh, than you do at your hand. We had fire over here. There you go. And I watch how you're aligned because that plow is. Fire making remains one of the basic and most rewarding skills. And whether it's soft wood or bamboo, there are many ways to rub sticks together. I've done as many as 200 in a day without a blister, but it's. It, how you use your hands, when you're learning, it's really easy to get a blister from the stick. Um, I make it look a little easier than it is. I've been doing it for about 25 years, but uh, it's, uh, it's some effort. There's some downward pressure that I'm pushing my hands together and smearing downward as I go. And there's maybe almost as much as 20 pounds of pressure going down that stick to create that hot friction. The idea here, is I'm doing this on the ground. So. so there's friction fire. And I love to see it when they get that thrill of a, of a fire making skill and they've started to learn it and they get that build that self confidence within them and, they, and, and a feeling of self worth that's really that you just cannot, you can't, money can't buy that. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, I've been flint napping for 25 years. It is my profession. Uh, I do it for a full-time living, and uh, I'm probably one of the few full-time, professional, legitimate flint nappers alive today. And uh, I must admit, it's a strange occupation to be in in this nuclear age. And uh, I often wonder why I'm doing it, but I know I need to. It's my contribution to uh, the past and to science. When I hold a rock, I, I feel a connection with the past, and I feel like I am creating something with my own hands. It, it is a passion, and uh, for me, when I sit down and flint nap, it's when I find uh, true peace in my life. And uh, just, it's just very relaxing and uh, almost meditative. You can't replicate brain tan deer hides any way other than just spending the elbow grease doing it and people people feel that when they feel the material you know the material is very sensual and very soft and very warm and friendly and humans have been brain tanning forever and so I think there's a lot of us in the world but there's not very many of them left in our culture I love that tactile thing when my my hands are feeling something and uh, and responding to it by um, just by sheer physical relationship with the world. I really enjoy um, getting my hands bloody and greasy when I'm pulling the hides off of there, you know, off of the animal. And then knowing though that even though that may be uh, a part of the process, it's something I'm working towards getting this velvety, soft, breathable, stretchy material. Oftentimes when I'm walking in the woods and I look down and I go, wow, between me and the deer, Everything I have on is from right here in the forest where I live, and that's a very rewarding feeling. This is a, a brain tan buckskin where um, wood ash uh, was used uh, to create a high pH uh, solution, you know, maybe a pH pushing into the high 12s so that it would help uh, uh, break down the glutens and other stuff in the hide so that you could scrape it really easy and so that when you finally did rinse it out and uh, immerse it in the brains from the deer, that it would soften up really nice. This is a fabric that, fabric that can last you with a lot of use for a good 10 to 15 years, whereas you know, jeans and cotton shirts and whatnot will never do that. And you can turn this into all kinds of things from you know, backpacks to satchel bags to clothing, moccasins, it's a very general purpose fabric. I got nicknamed Roadkill because when I first started coming to these kinds of gatherings, I wound up bringing an awful lot of uh, stuff I'd found on the road on the way. 
even roadkill coyotes are picked up. I just make sure when I'm done to wash my hands very well with soap and everything. Let's say about 90% of my meat consumption comes from roadkill deer. It's an almost unused uh, protein resource. I think it's very important to learn where your food comes from, how to gut an animal, how to process an animal, how to butcher it. Most people don't know how to do it. Most people don't want to do it. If you want to talk about health, it's very, it's a healthy kind of meat. It's maybe not so much coyotes, but if you're talking about deer, you can't buy any healthier meat than that. I am a full-time tanner right now. I just started tanning full-time a couple of months ago. Um, and so I tan and I sell hides and I uh, do workshops and, and I love it. This fox um, was a roadkill and um, I tanned it with um, eggs after scraping it. And then what I just did right now is um, smoke the hide to cure it and push all the moisture out and replace it with smoke resin. I'm gonna wear it around my neck and <laughs> keep me warm. <laughs> you never know what you'll find cooking in the campfire. It might be food or dye or anything else that needs heating up. <laughs> At mealtime, there's a wide variety of containers and utensils. These primitives may not be your typical environmentalist. Animal rights groups might find the use of animal parts appalling. All human food started out as alive. The closer you get to live food, the better it is for you. If we don't have a connection to the earth, we trash it, and that's what we're doing. If you show people the impact that they make on the environment in a really direct way, so if you, if you need to make a bow and you go and you cut down a tree, you see your impact, you see a stump, right? Then you go shoot a deer, you see your impact, you see a dead deer right there. What this does is it gives people a relationship to the earth that's really real, and they can see the impact, and when they see the impact and they see how the earth supports us and provides for us, then they care for it. When you care for it, you protect it. That, that you care for, you protect. That's it. It's as simple as that, really. These are uh, turkey calls made from turkey wing bones. And you use the three, three bones out of the wing of the turkey, cut them and put them together in a certain way to create this, this call. So you're using the turkey to hunt the turkey. When you're out in the woods, it seems like you need much less meat. So your main supply is plants. And I like to jokingly say that they're a lot slower and they're easier to catch them than the animals. This is a Paiute style deadfall. This is the highest level of integration you can have with planet Earth. Walking out literally naked into the wilderness and making a stone knife, a basic cutting implement, uh, finding a, a grinding stone, a basic implements for percussion and for cutting, and for braiding, and create a whole technology that lets you survive on the land, on this land, through your skill. It doesn't go, the relationship with the planet can't go any deeper than that. Sometimes modern technology is used in camp, but as little as possible. Many of these primitive skills experts don't live in conventional housing and live as much as they can off the land. I've lived without electricity and plumbing and um, those kinds of things for, yeah, 20 years, something like that. I can't even, I don't even remember, what, what do people need electricity for? The sounds and music come in many varieties. Sometimes using their own bodies. All areas of the country have an interest in primitive societies. Some museums specialize in aboriginal studies. 
everybody's ancestors came from the Stone Age at some point. So to me, that's what it's about. It's about connecting with that, uh, <clears throat> that, that common denominator. In 1989, the Society of Primitive Technology, or SPT, was formed at a meeting at the Schill Museum in Gastonia, North Carolina. They strive to promote research, practice, and teaching of primitive technology. We need a society of primitive technology to sort of act as a, a centralizing organization for primitive skills people because we're a very diverse group of people and we have a lot of folks with large interests in a wide range of fields here. That includes people that you know, work professionally within archaeology, you know, PhDs and graduate students. We also have people who you know, are very much uh, avocational people. We have people who simply do primitive skills as a lifestyle. We have people who uh, live in the bush and uh, you know, this is their day-to-day -day life. We have people who study this to try to replicate past life ways and, and everybody in between. The term experimental archaeology often describes what these modern primitives do. Experimental uh, archaeology is, is using the same materials that we use in the past that we know about and same methods as well as we've been able to reconstruct them based on archaeological excavations. We take that information they dig and then we make copies and reconstructions of the things and test them. By bringing everybody together it sort of expanded everybody's horizons now and the sharing of information is is just been like a you know like a nuclear explosion of, of interest in, in information. So the society puts out a bulletin twice a year. That bulletin of primitive technology, the Society of Primitive Technology sort of upped the bar for uh, primitive skills and made it known to a bit wider audience. A recent conference on reconstructive archaeology gave presenters an opportunity to show off their primitive skills. Well, the REARC conference is an attempt to bring together experimental archaeologists and primitive technologists to work together on these archaeological questions. Uh, fantastic things are being done in both fields, and, and REARC is an attempt uh, to, to marry those two fields together to, for, for a more effective tool for exploring the past. Primitive technologists that have spent you know, their entire life making pots, and talking to the archaeologists that spent their entire career digging up pots and interpreting these pots, working together collaboratively, collaboratively on these projects. Um, that, that's where the, you know, we, we can really get at a more clear picture of the past. On the northern Arizona border, with stunning views of Zion National Park, you can find John Olson. He's a primitive skills technician, outdoor survival instructor, and skilled potter. And like many modern primitives, he lives in multiple worlds. Petroglyphs adorn his living room, and drying hides hang in the trees. And not many modern people have a 16-foot wide replica of a 1,000-year-old kiva or underground ceremonial chamber in their yard. It's really fun to lay down on the floor and look up at the ceiling. Okay, we have an uh, uh, Aztec knife. This is kind of the extreme of primitive technology. Chert blade, uh, local stone, gold, turquoise, and jade. I say this is probably the extreme of primitive technology. I'm always exploring different, different uh, avenues of things. Basically, it starts with a coil right down here in the bottom and it just circles outward. And uh, you can make some fairly large pots with it. If you look at, look at the, the, the primitive sherds and even the primitive pots, and they're not so primitive, um, there's a, there is a connection there because there's fingerprints on it. And, and uh, I experience all the things that probably a primitive potter experienced with, with weather and uh, types of clay problems. Of all the pots I do, this is probably the most popular. And the painted ones are nice and pretty and all that. 
and people do like them, but there's something about corrugated that draws people to it. His skills in constructing primitive artifacts and replicating pottery result in museum quality pieces. So good, in fact, he drew the attention of federal law officials. It happened right over on that mountain, right over there. I was actually gathering, looking for a uh, chert. And I had some pots in the back seat and some points and a, a BLM vehicle went by and seen my, my car there. And they decided to just, you know, routinely go check it. Well, of course, they looked in my back seat and there's several pots laying there. <laughs> and I understand why they were uh, quite alarmed with it and they uh, called for backup. They wanted to know what I was doing. And I says, well, I was up getting rocks. And they go, well, you're digging pots. And I said, no, I'm not. He says, well, you got pots and monos in the back of your car. And I says, well, I made them. And uh, it was kind of a tussle there for probably four or five hours. They started to get the, the picture that uh, these were replicas and not real thing. At both Rabbit Stick and Winter Count, evening can become a time for celebration. I'm getting ready for mask night and um, it's going to be really fun. So we could all like celebrate and so it inspires people to come again and like so everybody has a good fun time. This is charcoal mixed with bear fat and a wood stick, all primitive. She's a pro, this is like... Five males on that, or? As with many primitive societies, bartering and trading is common. On some evenings, the trade blanket is laid out. Traders present their items and others offer possible deals. The best trade is then selected. Getting the next generation to learn these skills is important. Uh, so these kids can stand on our shoulders and get the benefit of all that we've learned by reintroducing these skills to the culture. And, uh, and, and it's the pattern that these skills teach the pattern of thinking, how to find food, how to find water, how to process raw materials, how to improvise our lives from the things that we have at hand. The Sipapu represents a connection to the previous life and to the earth. These primitives among us seek to connect to the people of the past, seek to connect to their mother earth, and they seek to connect to their fellow humans. It's hard to know where you're going if you don't know where you came from. And I think uh, trying to maintain traditions and to understand uh, what uh, cultures had to deal with in the past is, is important to us all. I, I love these gatherings uh, because uh, it's a, a chance for me to be with kindred souls. We, we just really bond over the skills, but then we expand our horizons of community. And I like to share the skills and the crafts with everybody, and, and I love watching children learn to be creative and think for themselves. It's a big thing to be able to, to get together and share and have this wonderful village, this village where there's people pounding on rocks and scraping on hides and and using willows and all that stuff, you know, all through the day. It's a wonderful feeling. I was kind of a closet abo for so many years that when I finally got heard and liked, I thought, 
I don't have to hide who I am anymore. These people actually hear what I say and like what I say. Uh, it's carrying on a tradition and carrying on our past that we need to carry on and not lose our past. <laughs> In this day when everyone seems to be connected through digital and electronic means, these modern primitives seek a different connection to the earth and to the past. That the whole universe is interconnectedness. Be connected with, with the elements of the planet that we live on. We're connecting with our ancestors, but we're also expanding our awareness of our environment and our, and our culture. And here, they actually have to slow down and make it work, and that draws to something inside their heart that's, that's more primal. If you dissect something or disconnect it, you kill it. So I think becoming connected and staying connected is about staying alive. I have learned so much from them beyond the survival skills. These people have heart. They just are the most, I'm sorry, they're the most giving, honest people I have ever met. A few people will take this and run with it, and it'll change their lives, and they'll change a few other lives, and it'll, it'll trickle. These modern primitives believe the embers of ancient skills ignite the flames of connection and community. By looking back, these primitives among us believe they kindled the flames of a brighter future.